But to be brutally frank, a lot of these Navy SEALs, and God bless them, the whole thing went a little too Hollywood. You got some guys zinking these guys. They're just a little too, and you got, you know, you got what Crenshaw down Texas and others. It's just a little too woke. Last thing we need is another woke Navy SEAL. It's Ken Harbaugh with Against All Enemies on the Midas Touch Network. I did not expect my holiday edition of Against All Enemies to start with Steve Bannon, but here we are. Apparently, Navy SEALs are now a little too woke. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine in a second, a former Navy SEAL with multiple combat deployments. But first, I want to share a story about a Christmas I spent on deployment. It was actually two Christmases in the same year. It'll make sense in a second. I'm sharing this story because there's this idea out there that the people who make up our military should be hardened warriors all the time, that there should be no room for anything else. I think that's why Ted Cruz retweeted a recruiting video from the Russian military, implying that our side was too soft. It's why Tommy Tuberville complained that the Navy sometimes allows poems to be read over the PA systems on our ships. And it's why Steve Bannon criticized Navy SEALs for being too woke. Never mind that none of these cosplay clowns would last two seconds, Bannon least of all, in a ring with an actual Navy SEAL. But back to my Christmas story. It was right after 9-11, and I was a mission commander leading an air crew halfway around the world. We had just wrapped up an emergency deployment responding to the 9-11 attacks, and we were trying to get our aircraft back home to the States for a much-needed overhaul. We stopped in Diego Garcia in late December for on-route repairs and fuel. Diego Garcia, or Dodge as we all referred to it, is an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, thousands of miles from anything else. In the months following 9-11, it became a fortress full of Americans and Brits and other Allied service members ramping up for the fight ahead. We were busy with repairs, trying to make sure we could limp back home 10,000 miles and more than an ocean away. You kind of lose track of time in moments like that. But I remember realizing one morning that it was Christmas Eve. It was sunny and warm. We were in the tropics, after all, and we were technically in the midst of a wartime effort. But I decided to take an hour off and drop in at the solitary all-faith chapel on the island for their Christmas Eve service. It was packed, it turns out. I wasn't the only one who had had that thought. My most vivid memory of that Christmas, maybe of any Christmas before my kids were born, was when the chaplain tried to lead us in singing a Christmas hymn. It was mostly young men, a few women, many of us wearing flight suits, some smeared with oil and grease, all of us desperately missing our families. I think we may have gotten five words into Silent Night. That was it. All around me, I heard these hardened pilots and crew chiefs and maintainers crying as quietly as they could as the chaplain finished the hymn for us. Right after that church service, I was back on the flight line. We left the next day early, island hopping to refuel. The aircraft was working great, and we spent our first Christmas day in transit, crossing the international date line late that night. Our last refueling stop before home was a base on the other side of the international date line. My crew was exhausted, and we settled into the barracks to get some rest before the last leg home. I realized it was Christmas, again. Crossing the date line had set the clock back a full day. So I had my second Christmas in as many days. Nothing was open, and dinner that night was a candy bar I had saved. It's possible I may have cried then, too. If that makes me too woke for the Ted Cruz's and Tommy Tuberville's and Steve Bannon's of the world, so be it. But you know what? They weren't there. They weren't on Diego Garcia in the wake of 9-11 trying to get a crew safely home. The Sunshine Patriots, the ones who so easily mock young Americans on watch halfway around the world, they are as far away from the front lines as they can be. Ted Cruz couldn't even manage a tough winner in Texas. If being sensitive to the reality of loss and loneliness that defines a life in uniform makes me and those I served with too woke, fine, I'll own it. Caring about the people around us actually makes our military stronger. Diversity makes our military stronger. Thoughtfulness makes our military stronger. So, if you could, take a moment this holiday to think about all of those on watch 
halfway around the world so that people like Steve Bannon can have the freedom to say idiotic things about the service and sacrifice of others. And now, because Steve Bannon specifically called out Navy SEALs for being too woke, I want to share part of a conversation I had with Brett Jones, one of the toughest people I have ever encountered. He is also the first openly gay member of the SEAL teams, and twice the person Steve Bannon will ever be. Brett deployed to combat zones more times than I can count, and I guarantee that if he had been in that chapel with me back on Diego Garcia, he would have been crying too. Here he is, talking about pushing back against the meanness and cruelty that has come to define the politics of people like Steve Bannon. I feel like that, the the hurting of people, has become a part of our politics lately in a way that it it wasn't before. Cruelty seems to be the point when former President Trump uh, mocks uh, a disabled person or or talks about roughing suspects up, putting them into to police cars. Th- those lines get the loudest applause at his at his rallies. Something seems to have gone off the rails in a party that celebrates the cruelty for cruelty's sake. How do you react? Um, well, obviously, I, I don't, I don't like that, right? I don't, um, I, 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 you know, it's no secret, I didn't vote for Trump. And, uh, <laughs> and he is certainly not a statesman. And um, I think that, um, and, you know, I, I think a, a poor example of, of how we should treat other people, for sure. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the, the the politics of what he believes and, and whatnot, but but here's the thing, man: is people are people, and it's it's really really easy to take people and just uh, you know our brains. I feel like are probably triggered more towards um, more towards that uh, negative, like you know, it's it's really easy to dislike somebody it's really easy to hate somebody it doesn't it requires no work and um and it weighs on you and then it, it's a cancer it grows and then it, it, it morphs into other things it's really hard to to understand and try to relate and and show compassion to people that's that's fucking work that's really fucking hard work and um and when i see people like that i'm like I guess that I don't think they're ready for that kind of work yet. Yeah. There's this great Brene Brown quote. She says, it's hard to hate up close. And I have to believe that one of the defining features of those islands of blue and seas of red, as you described Huntsville, is the flat fact that there is more diversity. There is there is more education. You're surrounded by people who challenge your your preconceptions. Does that hold? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, one of the things that I love about, I mean, I feel like diversity is one of those things that just adds color to the world. And because if I grew up in an environment where beliefs were supposed to be the same, right? And, and those beliefs and those ideals and those ideas um, b- became very boring to me and um, and not uh, like it, it just felt stale and as I got older and was introduced to different types of people and different views and religions and and even though I might not agree with some of them it brought color into into my life and uh, um, and I believe that there's a place and a conversation here for everyone, right? And, um, you know, yeah, I'm, I didn't vote for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you make of his, I mean, it's almost like he's impersonating Mussolini or the, the strong men of eras past in the way he carries himself, in the way he bullies uh those who who stand up to him and i'm asking you as a as a navy seal we don't get navy seals on this show all the time 
but you you have to have a a, a pretty um, pretty insightful perspective on on toxic masculinity having been at the tip of the spear of America's national defense. Um, yeah, so I think uh, you know you said it right there. I I, I you know I watched the whole uh, you know, like every American did, and I I was like, wow, man, this guy is is the definition of of a bully, and um, and I think the thing that fuels a bully is when they it works right when you do something and and you use um, shame or or insults or, or or whatever the case is to as a uh tool to get what you want and then it works it's it's like well damn that's uh that just adds to that that ego uh or that um you know that that bullies that that th that bullies live off of right thanks for watching everyone i am trying something new a patreon page it's a way you can support the show and make sure we can keep bringing you this content. My hope is that we can continue to limit the amount of ads we run here and that we can also build a community around this effort to fight back against extremists and their enablers. Subscribers to the Patreon page will have access to exclusive and ad-free content and also early releases. Please consider helping us out. Go to patreon.com slash Ken Harbaugh or click on the link below. We're just getting started with this. So your support early on will make a huge difference in building real momentum. Thanks so much for helping out. Well, it, the bullying and these these weird demonstrations of virility, as Ruth Ben Giat would call them, didn't just work for for Trump. They they infected the entire Republican Party. I mean, you have. People like Josh Hawley, who, who I don't think anyone should take manliness lessons from. He's the guy who fist pumped the insurrectionists on January 6th, right? He's writing a book about how to be a real man. I mean, this has become a trope on the right. How how does something like this happen? And how do the uh, how do those of us who see through it call it out? Well, I think just like that right um like you do obviously see through it and you are calling it out right and um and 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 that's what it is is uh yeah it, it's a um it's a very it's very easy to fall into something it's very easy to get angry at something that you don't understand that's 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 human nature right like oh i don't understand that person over there because they mow their yard on tuesdays instead of the weekends who the who the f does that what is that i don't understand that they're a shitty neighbor <laughs> right? like it's just easy to categorize things you don't understand uh into uh i don't like that was a clip of my conversation with former Navy SEAL Brett Jones. I'll put a link to the full interview below. Thank you, everyone, for making this such an incredible year for Against All Enemies and Burn the Boats. Happy holidays.